Hi, everybody. It's Professor Mitchell. We have made it to the last chapter to cover in this course. Woohoo! And that is chapter 11 on goodness of fit and contingency tables. So we'll start in section 11.1 on goodness of fit. By goodness of fit, we mean that sample data consisting of observed frequency counts arranged in a single row or column called a one-way frequency table agree with some particular distribution such as normal or uniform being considered. We will use a hypothesis test for the claim that the observed frequency counts agree with the claimed distribution. So a goodness of fit test is used to test the hypothesis that an observed frequency distribution fits or conforms to some claimed distribution. So the objective in this section is to conduct a goodness of fit test, which is a hypothesis test to determine whether a single row or column of frequency counts agrees with some specific distribution, such as uniform or normal. So the notation that we'll be using in this section, O will stand for the observed frequency of an outcome found from the sample data, E will represent the expected frequency of an outcome found by assuming that the distribution is as claimed. So as a really quick example, uh, suppose that you were testing a die to see if it was an ordinary fair die. Each number on the die uh, should come up roughly the same number of times. Uh, and let's say that you rolled the die 100 times. And if it's a six-sided die, that means you would expect each number to come up around 16 or 17 times uh, to be exact 16.6666. That would be E, the expected frequency. So then you actually roll the die 100 times. Each number will come up a certain number of times, and that'll be the observed frequency. All right. So K represents the number of different categories or cells. In the example of a uh, die, uh, K would be six because there are six possible outcomes. N represents the total number of trials or the total number of observed sample values. So in my little die example just now, N would be 100. And P represents the probability that a sample value falls within a particular category. All right, so uh, requirements of testing for goodness of fit. Number one, the data have been randomly selected. Number two, the sample data consists of frequency counts for each of the different categories. And third, for each category, the expected frequency is at least five. The expected frequency for a category is the frequency that would occur if the data actually have the distribution that is being claimed. There is no requirement that the observed frequency for each category must be at least five. All right, so the null and alternative hypotheses in this kind of test, the null hypothesis would be that the frequency counts agree with the claimed distribution. The alternative uh, would be that the frequency counts do not agree with the claimed distribution. So in my example of testing a die to see whether it's fair, uh, the null hypothesis would be that the die is fair, that each number comes up roughly the same number of times. Uh, that would be an example of a uniform distribution. All right, so here is the test statistic that we'll be using. Uh, and I think that's a typo. That should say goodness of fit test. Uh, it is a chi-square distribution. Uh, and this test statistic is found by doing the following. For each outcome, you take the observed frequency minus the expected frequency. You square that difference. Okay, so note that that will, always, that will never come out to be negative. You divide that square by E, the expected frequency, and then you add all of those up for each outcome. All right, 
So uh, as usual, we'll talk about two different approaches for the hypothesis test, the p-value approach. Uh, chi-square is another one of those distributions that in order to get an exact p-value, you have to use technology. If the only thing you have access to is the table, and that's table A4, uh, then it would be a range of p-values, which is usually good enough. Or you can use the critical value approach. Critical values are found in table A4. You don't have to use technology uh, unless the um, level of significance is something really weird, all right? Table A4 has all of the usual uh, levels of significance, but if they made alpha equal to 0 0.06 or 0 0.035 or something like that, then yes, you would have to use technology, but usually not. Critical values are found in table A4 by using K minus one degrees of freedom, where again, K is the number of categories. And here's some good news. If you have ever been confused by when is it left-tailed, right-tailed, two-tailed, goodness of fit hypothesis tests are always, always, always right-tailed. So that's kind of nice. That's one less thing to keep track of. All right, frequencies. Conducted a, uh, conducting a goodness of fit test requires that we identify the observed frequencies, denoted by O, then find the frequencies expected, denoted by E, with the claimed distribution. There are two different approaches for finding expected frequencies E. If the expected frequencies are all equal, such as in the case of the uh, testing the die to see if it's fair, uh, then E is just N divided by K. So in my example, uh, it would be 100 divided by 6, and that's where you get the 16.66666. If the expected frequencies are not all equal, then calculate E equals N times P for each individual category. And I need to say, uh, you can actually get by with this second one all the time. It's just that for each outcome, P would always be the same, okay? So, um, you know, if, if you would rather just uh, try to keep track of one thing, it would definitely be the second thing. The second thing does always work. All right. <clears throat> oh, this sounds familiar. A single die is rolled 45 times with the following results. Assuming that the die is fair, and all outcomes are equally likely, find the expected frequency E for each empty cell. All right, so 45 times, we're assuming that all outcomes are equally likely. In that case, we would just do N divided by K, 45 divided by six is 7.5. Uh, if you decided to use N times P, that would also work. P would be 1 sixth. So instead of 45 over 6, you would get 45 times 1 sixth, which is exactly the same thing. Okay. If the die is fair and the outcomes are all equally likely, we expect that each outcome should occur about 7.5 times. All right. Using the same results from part A, suppose we claim that instead of being fair, the die is loaded so that the outcome of 1 occurs 50% of the time, and the other five outcomes occur 10% of the time. The probabilities are listed in the second row below. Here they are. Using n equals 45, and the probabilities listed below, we find that for the first cell, here's where we have to use n times p, 45 times 0.5 is 22.5, so we would expect out of 45 rolls, for the number one to come up uh, approximately 22.5 times. Each of the other five cells will have the expected value of n times p would be 45 times 0.1, which is 4.5, okay? So two different scenarios, but in both of them, you have all of your observed frequencies and your expected frequencies. We know that sample frequencies typically differ somewhat from the values we theoretically expect. So we consider this key question. Are the differences between the actual observed frequencies O 
and the theoretically expected frequencies E significant. All right. So, you know, if, if each one of them, uh, if each one of these frequencies was off by only one or two, uh, we wouldn't be surprised by that. But if they're way, way, way off, uh, then we might suspect that something weird is going on. So to measure the discrepancy between the O and E values, we use this test statistic. So if this number comes out to be significantly large, it turns out, uh, then we will reject the idea that the distribution is what somebody claimed it was, um, and it looks like it's probably something else. All right, relationships among the chi-square test statistic, the p-value, and the goodness of fit. So you compare the observed O values to the corresponding expected E values. If on the one hand, the O's and the E's are reasonably close, then your value of chi-square, the test statistic, would come out to be pretty small. It would come out somewhere in this range. And you would get a large p-value. So in this case, the p-value is going to be the area to the right of this test statistic. And remember, when P is high, the null will fly. So we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. And we would say that this data does appear to be a good fit with the assumed distribution. On the other hand, if the O's and the E's are far apart, far apart enough, then you would get a large chi-square value and a small P value. So chi-square would be up here somewhere. When P is low, the null must go. You would reject your null hypothesis, and you would say that this data is not a good fit with the assumed distribution. All right, so here is our first official example. Last digits of weights. A random sample of 100 weights of Californians is obtained and the last digits of those weights are summarized in the table. When obtaining weights of subjects, it is extremely important to actually measure their weights instead of asking them to report their weights. Test the claim that the sample is from a population of weights in which the last digits do not occur with the same frequency. All right. So, you know, if we had a bunch of people, a hundred people, and we actually weighed them, we would expect the last digit of their weight, you know, all of these last digits, we would expect them to come up, you know, pretty close to equally often, right? Well, in this case, it looks like these weights might have been self-reported because look at how many of them end in a zero or a five, all right? Think about, you know, how do you respond when a doctor or something asks you uh, for your weight? Chances are you give them a number ending in a zero or a five, right? Because it's a nice round number, okay? But if they actually weigh you, uh, your weight is just as likely to end with a zero or a five as any other number, okay? <clears throat> All right, so let's check our requirements. Uh, first, the data come from randomly selected subjects. Number two, the data do consist of frequency counts, as shown in the table. And then with 100 sample values and 10 categories that are claimed to be equally likely, each expected frequency is 10. 100 times 1 tenth, or 100 divided by 10. So each expected frequency does satisfy the requirement of being a value of at least five. So all of the requirements are satisfied. All right, step one, the original claim is that the digits do not occur with the same frequency, which means at least one of the probabilities, P0, P1, up to P9. So in this case, P1, for example, would be the probability that a randomly selected person's weight ends with a one. P7 would be the probability that it ends with a seven, okay? So the claim is at least one of these probabilities is different from the others. It definitely looked like P0 and P5 were much larger than the other probabilities. However, if that claim is false, 
then that means all of the probabilities are the same. Okay, so this right here is going to be your null hypothesis. The null hypothesis must contain the condition of equality. So we have the null hypothesis is that all of these probabilities are equal. The null hypothesis is that at least one of them is different. Okay, so logically, these two statements have opposite meaning. Step four, uh, they actually did not give us a significance level. So we'll select the common choice of alpha equals 0.05. In your statistics homework, they will always, always, always give you a significance level. Uh, otherwise, different people are gonna get different answers. Step five, because we're testing a claim about the distribution of the last digits being uniform, we're going to use the goodness of fit test described in this section, which is a chi-square distribution. Step six, the observed frequencies O are in the table. Uh, each corresponding expected frequency E is equal to 10. So they got this display using XL stat, which we have not been using. Uh, so what I'll show you on the next slide uh, is how to com uh, compute it manually. Okay. So it's really not that, that hard. Uh, here are all my last digits. Here are the observed frequencies. Here are the expected frequencies. So let me walk you through uh, two or three rows of this. O minus E in this first row is 46 minus 10, which is 36. And then in this column, we're going to square that difference. 36 squared is 1,296. And then in the last column, we're going to divide this number by E, which is 10. 1296 divided by 10 is 129.6. Okay. In the next row, we have 1 minus 10 is negative 9. The square of negative 9 is positive 81. Remember, you should not have any negative numbers in this column. Okay. And then 81 divided by 10 is 8.1. Okay et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then once you have all of those O minus E squared over E's, you add them all up and that gives you your calculated test statistic. So I just wanna point out uh, before we move on to the next slide, notice the two largest values under O minus E squared over E go with the zero outcome and the five outcome. All right, they account for, you know, almost all, well, not almost all, but the vast majority of this 212.8 came from here, the 129.6, and here the 40, okay? When you notice things like that, it helps you understand this a little better. The test statistic is chi-square equals 212.8. The critical value, we'll look for this in a second, is chi-square equals 16.919. So let's go over to table A4 for a second. I have it all ready to go right here. Okay, so I wish I could make it a little bigger. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, that's a little better, I guess. Okay. So uh, the degrees of freedom is K minus one. Remember K was 10. So here's nine degrees of freedom and how they came up with the 16.99, we want the value that cuts off 0 0.05 on the right, okay? All of these tests are right tailed, okay? So where the nine degrees of freedom meets the 0 0.05, you see your 16.919. All right, I was hoping they had a picture of a chi-square distribution. Oh, here we go, there's one on the next slide, good. I think that might be helpful. Okay, um, 
<clears throat> in a minute, we will uh, try to get the p-value for this. They're saying it's less than 0 0.0001. Okay, so here is, remember the chi-square uh, distribution is not symmetrical, kind of looks like this, it is skewed to the right. So here is your critical value of 16.919. This green area over here would be exactly 0 0.05. And then way, 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 way off over here somewhere would be the test statistic of 212.8. So the area cut off by, by that 212.8, is less than 0 0.0001. Okay. Uh, in order to try to figure that out yourself, let me remind you how we have done this before. So I've got Google up here, chi-square distribution calculator. Now I learned the hard way this semester uh, that my favorite website, StatTrack, is not always the greatest for chi-square because um, I remember one time it gave me the p-value to only two decimal places, which was not good enough for my math lab. So uh, the website that I like to use is this socsystatistics.com. That seemed to work well for us last time. So let's go to that site. And we're going to put in 212. 0.8 at nine degrees of freedom. Uh, you don't really have to put in the significance level. It's going to tell you whether to reject or fail to reject. Uh, but I think that part's easy to figure out. <clears throat> All right, the p-value is less than 0 0.00001. I think I said zero four times. The result is significant at uh, less than five, which means okay. So going back here. If we use the p-value method of testing hypotheses, we see that the p-value is small, less than 0 0.0001. So we reject the null hypothesis. If we use the critical value method of testing hypotheses, the previous figure shows that the test statistic falls in the critical region, so there is sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. There is sufficient evidence to support the claim, remember the original claim, that the last digits do not occur with the same relative frequency. All right. The good suggested uh, not provide fit with the claimed uniform diffusion of equally likely frequencies. Instead, actually weighing the subjects, it appears that the subjects reported their weights. In fact, the weights are from the California Health Interview Survey, and the title of that survey indicates that subjects were interviewed, not measured. Because those weights are reported, the reliability of the data is very questionable. All right, here's another example. I learned something new from this one. According to Benford's law, many data sets have the property that the leading or first digits follow the distribution shown in the first two rows of the table below. The bottom row lists the frequencies of leading digits of internet traffic inter-arrival times. Very computer science-y example. Do the frequencies in the bottom row fit the distribution according to Benford's law, okay? So in the last example, we were checking to see if the frequency was uniform. In this case, uniform. Uh, one is supposed to be the leading digit the most, followed by two, followed by three. So it kind of tapers off, right? The, uh, as the leading digits get larger, the, um, they occur less and less often. And it was found that uh, one was a leading digit 69 times, two was a leading digit 40 times, three was a leading digit 42 times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are our uh, observed frequencies. 
Okay, did they ever say, oh, no, they didn't, but we can figure it out. Did, uh, my question was, did they ever say uh, exactly how many of these uh, times they were looking at and no they didn't say that we're going to have to figure that out by adding all of our observed frequencies together so that's easy enough the sample data are randomly selected from a larger population the sample data do consist of frequency counts each expected frequency at least five the lowest expected frequency is 271 times 0.46, that's supposed to say 0 0.046. Okay. Uh, the, the expected frequency for the nine, all right. I see that they, uh, that they did use 0 0.046 here because they got 12.466, okay. So all of these expected frequencies are at least five. Okay, before I left this slide, I had to fix that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have remembered later, and it would have bugged me. All right, step one. The original claim is that the leading digits fit the distribution given as Benford's law. Using subscripts corresponding to the leading digits, we can express this claim as P1 equals 0 0.301 and P2 equals 0.176 and P3 equals 0.125. Da, 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 up to P9 equals 0 0.046. So notice we're getting those numbers just from this uh, second row. Okay. All right. So the null hypothesis is that the uh, probabilities are equal to these numbers. If the original claim is false, then at least one of the proportions does not have the value as claimed. The null hypothesis must contain the condition of equality. So we have the null hypothesis is P1 equals 0 0.301 and P2 equals 0.176, da, 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 and P9 equals 0 0.046. The alternative would be at least one of those proportions is not equal to the given claimed value. And once again, they did not specify a significance level to the common voice of alpha e. All right, step five, because we're testing the claim that the distribution of leading digits fits the distribution given by Benford's law, we use the goodness of fit test described in this section. Step six, the table shows the calculations of the components of the chi-square test statistic for the leading digits of one and two. So for leading digit of one, it was observed that the one came up 69 times. The expected frequency would be 271 times 0 0.301, which is 81.571. So when you do 69 minus 81.571, you get negative 12.571. You square that, you get 158.03. Divide that by E, which is 81.571, you get 1.9373, okay? Uh, let's look at the two. Two came up 40 times. We expect it to come up 17.6% of 271, which is 47.696. <clears throat> 40 minus 47.696 is negative 7.696. You square that, you get 59.2284. Divide that by 47.696, you get 1.241. Eight. All right, I wanted to show you how easy it is to do these calculations on Excel. So what I've done is I've set up a spreadsheet where I have my leading digits, uh, which are just going to be labels. These are not going to be used in the uh, calculations. I have the expected probabilities from Benford's law. 
and then I have my observed frequencies. So the first thing I need to do is calculate my expected frequencies. And the way I'm going to do that, first I'm going to ask Excel to add up all the numbers in this row. So I'm going to say equals sum of all of these values. All right, 271, just like they said. So here, I'm going to say equals 271 times this value over here. And I'm going to do that as a cell reference so that when I copy this cell down to the rest of the row, uh, it will use you know, the number from the correct row. So there's the 81.571. And if I copy this and paste it down here, it will give me all of my expected frequencies. So now watch what I do next. O minus E. I'm going to tell Excel to do this number minus this number. And I am going to do that all the way down this column. And then in the next column, I'm going to ask for the square of that cell. So there's the 158.03. I'm going to copy this all the way down. All right, and then the last uh, column is O minus E squared divided by E. So we just did O minus E squared. So I'm going to say Excel, please divide this value by this value over here is E. All right, do that all the way down the column. And then remember my test statistic is the sum of this column. So here's something sneaky. Uh, over here, I remembered that I summed this column here. So I will just copy that formula over here. And this is my calculated test statistic, 11.279. Is that the same thing as what they got? I do believe it is. All right, if we include all nine leading digits, we get the test statistic, chi-squared equals 11.2792, as shown in the TI-84 calculator display. The critical value is chi-square equals 15.507, which is found in table A4, with alpha equals 0 0.05 in the right tail and degrees of freedom equal to k minus 1, which is 8. Remember, in this problem, there were nine categories. The TI-84 display shows the value of the test statistic, as well as the p-value of 0.186. All right, so we would get that off uh, socialstatistics.com. The p-value of 0.186 is greater than the significance level of 0 0.05. So there is not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. There is not sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that the 271 leading digits fit the distribution given by Benford's law. It looks like it's fit Benford's law. The sample of leading digits does not provide enough evidence to conclude that the Benford's law distribution is not being followed. There is not sufficient evidence to support a conclusion that the leading digits are from inner arrival times that are not from normal traffic. So there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that an internet intrusion has occurred. That's what Benford's law is used to measure. All right, and uh, here's a little 
picture they drew. In the figure, we use a green line to graph the expected proportions given by Benford's law, along with a red line for the observed proportion. So you see it's not perfect, but it is very, very close. The figure allows us to visualize the goodness of fit between the distribution given by Benford's law and the frequencies that were observed. The green and red lines agree reasonably well, so it appears that the observed data fit the expected values reasonably well. And that takes care of section 11.1. We'll see you next time.